Welcome to How to Cook That, I'm Anne Reardon and you've been asking for more 200 year old recipes so this week I am challenging myself to make this amazing dessert centrepiece by Napoleon Bonaparte's French pastry chef. The recipe to make this masterpiece is 10 pages long and it took me more than two and a half days to make it. To start with it says to make the confectioner's paste. Take one pound and a half of sifted flour, make a hole in the centre as usual and put there in two eggs, three yolks and a pound of pounded sugar and a pinch of salt. Stir this for two minutes only in order that the sugar may be a little melted. Add afterwards the flour and another yolk if necessary so that it may be of the same thickness as the paste for making hot and cold pies. Back then they called pastry paste and this is way too dry to be a pastry. So I'll add another egg and let's cheat by swapping to the mixer. It's still too dry so I'm going to have to add another egg and that's still not enough. So another egg. At this point I'm beginning to worry that the recipe might not be accurate because instead of two eggs and three yolks we've needed five eggs and three yolks. The recipe then says to give it five or six turns by working it well with your wrists which will render it particularly sleek and binding. It says on the main page that we need a pound and a half of this confectioner's paste so let's weigh what this recipe has given us. Three pounds so that's double what it says we need so we should have plenty. It doesn't actually look like it's going to be enough to me which is strange because it's supposed to be double the amount that we need so we'll try. Roll it out to a little more than one sixth of an inch in thickness and put on a large baking plate lightly buttered and then cut it round 15 inches in diameter. 15 inches is huge and it's not going to fit on any of my baking trays or in my oven. From the picture this is the base and it sticks out quite a long way from the layer above so I'm going to make it 12 inches and use the largest cake tin I've got to cut the circle size. Place another piece of paste on a middle sized baking plate buttered and cut it likewise round 10 inches in diameter. So now we have a 15 inch and a 10 inch circle and then it asks for another round piece of paste which is 6 inches and this is all the pastry that I have left after doing that and we've got more pieces to make so I'm going to have to make up another batch of the confectioner's paste so the quantities in this recipe are way out. Take two more pieces each forming a half round of 8 inches in diameter and cover two molds lightly buttered. I wasn't sure here if it meant half circles or hemispheres but after looking at the picture of the finished piece I think it must be hemispheres. With the leftover roll them out in large strips a full half inch in diameter then cut them into small columns of 13 inches in length. Now if they're 13 inches in length the columns aren't going to fit. When you read further on it says they have to go inside this bit here but those ones are only 3 inches so we can't put something that's 13 inches in there. I'll make them 3 inch for the top and 5 inch for the bottom. I'm not sure if they should be strips or columns so let's just go with strips and hopefully that's good. The version of the recipe that I have here has been translated to English from French nearly 200 years ago and I'm not sure if some of the quantities were incorrectly translated and that's where the inaccuracies are coming from or if Karim could not do maths and that is entirely possible because he was only 10 years old when he was abandoned by his family during the French Revolution. To get food to eat and a place to sleep he worked pretty much like a slave in a kitchen. He was only 10, he's only a little kid. I just feel terrible thinking about that. By the age of 30 due to his talent and determination despite his terrible start and terrible situation he ended up becoming the pastry chef for the kings and for quite some time he was the pastry chef for Napoleon and even made his wedding cake. The recipe says to put the whole in a moderate oven and turn the three round pieces and when they've acquired a regular yellow colour take them out as also the uprights provided they are thoroughly dry. As soon as the half round are a little coloured take them out. 
look at that this stuff is pretty crazy it's harder than gingerbread it's a bit like um reminds me of like a, a baby rusk but it's sweet it's edible but i don't think anyone will eat this part because it's so hard with the point of a small knife, make an opening of an inch in width in the center of one of the half rounds and another of two inches and a half in the center of the other. This stuff is so hard to cut. Look, it started to crack in the corner there. You should definitely cut this out before or during the baking, not after. And that's exactly what I did here with the second one. And that was heaps easier. There were no cracks in that one. Afterwards, it says make 30 wafers with pistachios as directed on page 84. Let them be three inches in length and a quarter of an inch in width. Now this is confusing me because three by a quarter is like this, it's super skinny. And according to the picture, it has to go all the way around the circle. So if we look at our six inch circle, the circumference of a circle is two pi r. And the radius would be three. So that's two pi times three, which would be equal to, let me just get a calculator. That equals 18.85. So if we have strips that are a quarter of an inch and we divide 18.85 by one quarter, then we would need 75 wafers just to do this section. And it only told us to make 30 and it's supposed to do both this section and the section below. So I think this is definitely wrong. There's something going on with the numbers in this recipe. Let's try one and a quarter inch instead of a quarter, which will look more in proportion to the way it's pictured. Then we would need 15 for the six inch circle. So I'm gonna do that three inch by one and a quarter for that level. And then on the picture, the bottom one is actually taller than the middle one. So I'm gonna make those five inch instead of three, and we'll do that with one and a quarter width two. So using our same calculations for the 10 inch circle, that is going to mean that we are going to need 25 of the five inch ones. Okay, good, let's do that. Cut half a pound of sweet almonds blanched in very thin fillets and put them in a small tureen with four ounces of powdered sugar, half a tablespoon of flour, the peel of an orange grated, two whole eggs and the yolk of another, and a grain of salt. Stir the ingredients gently together so not to break the almonds. And when the whole has been well mixed, butter lightly a baking plate, pour this mixture upon it, and level it with the blade of a large knife. I'm using the back of a spoon because I think it's easier. These wafers actually turned out amazingly yummy. I've never seen a recipe like this before with no butter in it, and they are gorgeous, so you wanna make those. I'll write all these recipes out for you on the howtocookthat.net website so that you can make them too, and there's a link to that below. Then cover that lightly with two ounces of pistachios blanched and cut into small fillets and put in a moderate oven so that both sides of the wafer may acquire a clear light brown color. I found it easiest to cut these while they were still a bit soft into all the strips that we need and then bake them in the oven again to make sure they're all evenly golden. And you actually need to make three lots of the wafer recipe to get enough for this dessert. Then it says make also 24 cakes a la duchesse. Duchess, duchess, I'm not French, I have no idea how to say these words. <laughs> Put a stew pan, two glasses of water and two ounces of butter. When it boils, take it off the fire and add in six ounces of sifted flour. Then dry the paste in the usual manner. Now, if you've ever made choux pastry before, you'll recognize this recipe straight away. You need to stir the mixture over the heat for a couple of minutes or it won't puff up properly in the oven. Put into it a little salt, two eggs, and two ounces of pounded sugar. When the ingredients have been well mixed, add to it two more eggs and the peel of a lemon chopped very fine. Now I'm gonna pipe these, but they didn't have piping bags back then. So the recipe says sprinkle a board with flour and form your shoe of the usual size. And after which roll them out to three inches in length, but with as little flour as possible in order to make them look clear when baked. Place them successively on a baking plate at the distance of two inches and a half from each other. 
Bake them in a hot oven and when cold fill with marmalade of apricots, peaches or gooseberry jelly. I don't know about you but I cannot imagine eating one of these filled with jam so I'm going to use custard to fill them instead. Karim apparently invented the croquembouche so he must have swapped for custard somewhere in the future because people tend to prefer these filled with custard. Further on in the recipe it also says we need croquignols a la reine. I don't know how to say these things so let's make those now. Pound a stick of vanilla with two ounces of sugar. You can see all the little seeds from the vanilla beans are now mixed into that sugar. That looks great. Pass the whole through a silk sieve and then add seven ounces of sugar and eight ounces of sifted flour after which add the whole to the whites of the four eggs beaten up very stiff. Then work it for some minutes until it becomes sleek and soft. This is actually looking pretty dry, not so much sleek and soft. I'm not sure if the recipe quantities are wrong here too, but I don't know what they're supposed to look like. It may have needed more egg whites, but because I don't know, I'm just gonna go with what the cookbook said. It also said that these could be colored red, green or yellow, so I'm gonna go with some red. I'm also gonna use a piping bag for these ones. They put spoonfuls on a buttered baking tray. Now these did turn out really super hard, so if I was making this recipe again, I'd swap them for modern macarons, but I'm not gonna make this recipe again because it took so long to make. <laughs> Then beat up the whites of six eggs very stiff and mix with them eight ounces of pounded sugar. They would of course be doing all of this by hand but I'm going to use my stand mixer. Put half of it over each half round taking care that it is everywhere of an equal thickness. Put them in a slack oven and let them bake one hour. I've never seen anything like this before. Covering a hard pastry shell in meringue, this is just like genius. I'm using some acetate here just to smooth that out and then it can go in the oven. The half rounds being thoroughly dry, beat up the whites of six more eggs and mix them as the former with eight ounces of pounded sugar. Make 30 small meringues of an inch in width and the same height, covering them with fine sugar. As soon as the sugar is melted, strew some coarse sugar over them and immediately put them on a board in the oven. Mask the half round which has the smallest opening with the first half of the remaining white of an egg and then place your pistachios with points upwards carefully and regularly upon them. Observe however that they should not be stuck in deep nor be put where you intend placing the other small meringues for which you must leave six vacant spaces at regular distances from each other and of an inch in width. Then proceed to ornament the other half of the round in the same manner, placing however the pistachios in the contrary way, that is with their points pointing downwards. Put your half rounds immediately in the oven. When your small meringues are baked, place three of them on the half round that has the large opening. Thus put the first on the vacant space where there are no pistachios and close to the edge of the half round. The next a quarter of an inch above the former and the third a quarter of an inch above the second. Place afterwards three meringues in the same manner on each of the five remaining vacant spaces where you have put no pistachios. Now I of course here have put four not three but this one is the one that's going to be sitting on the base so it can't have four on these ones. I've got to take those off and put four on the other one. Then it says to put the half round in the oven again and bake it until it's evenly coloured. So this is the fourth time that these hemispheres are going back into the oven. So now I have all the components of this dessert ready and all of these plus the filled shoe pastry that's in the fridge. I sure hope that this all fits together or I will have wasted two days of baking. It says after this put four ounces of sugar to the boil with a fourth part of glass of water and the moment it begins to be lightly coloured cover the stove partly with ashes so as to absorb the heat and still leave the fire sufficiently strong to keep the sugar in a syrup. Wow can you imagine doing all of this over a wood fire and all of that baking in a wood fire oven. How easy is it for us just to turn things on and turn the stove down when we want it down? This guy was amazing. 
Dip the end of a wafer in the pan and place it immediately on the middle sized piece of paste. Proceed with the remaining wafers in the same manner, placing them upright close to each other so as to form a perfect circle. And then next it says to put the center columns in for support. So obviously they were supposed to be columns and not strips. It's changing its mind halfway through the recipe, but I'm sure strips will be fine. Now that I'm putting them in, I can see these strips are a bit shorter than the wafers, which means they have shrunk in the oven as they dried out. So it would be a good idea to make these first and then measure them and make the wafers match those. So hopefully the weight of the top is not going to make the wafers crack now that these supports are a bit shorter. Then it says to heat some sugar and after pouring some drops of it on the ends of the columns, and I'm going to have to pour some on the wafers because the columns are a bit short, turn the small piece of paste together with its columns on the centre of the larger and fasten it by pressing it lightly down. Ouch, I burnt my finger with the hot sugar, so I'm going to swap to thicker gloves for the next bit. Let's do that same thing for the smaller circle. I am so glad we did our calculations earlier or we would not have had anywhere near enough of these wafers to go around one of these circles, let alone both of them. If you can read French, I'd love to know if you can find the original book online and let me know if the measurements and the everything was wrong on the original French version or if it's just in the translation. I'd love to know which of those it is. Flip that over and make sure it's in the middle. Next it says to glaze the small cakes a la duchesse with sugar boiled to a crack and fix them in the manner represented on the plate by fastening them lightly with a little caramel. It says to put these things around the edge here but in the picture they look so much smaller. We did pipe them to the exact size that it said so perhaps that measurement was out too. When we made the 200 year old fruit pie recipe, it had meat in it, which was pretty disgusting. And you were supposed to leave the filling unrefrigerated for four months. So we put some of that aside in a jar and lots of people have been asking how the unrefrigerated meat is going. We actually opened that jar on a live video a few weeks ago and amazingly, it actually smelled really good. It smelled exactly the same as the day that we put it in. What does it smell? It smells exactly the same as it did it like does. two months ago. It it doesn't actually smell off at all. There was no mold, there was nothing on it, so their method of preserving that meat in the fruit pie worked really well. Then it says, put immediately eight croquignols à la René, however you say them, part on the bottom on the inside of the half round and let them project a little above the rim in order to steady the second half round. So this is gonna sort of hold the top in place. Then place the half round with the large opening like a cup on the small piece of paste. I guess it does kind of look like a cup and saucer there. The moment you are going to serve it, fill the bottom with cream a la chantilly, flavoured with vanilla and fine sugar, taking care that the cream is raised up in a pyramid above the edge of the half round on the top of which you put some fine strawberries. Place the second half round on top of the first. Now apparently you're supposed to use that hole to fill it with even more cream but there's already more than a litre of cream in this so I'm not going to whip up any more. I'm just going to do the last step which is to add one more meringue on top to hide that hole. Look at that magnificent creation. Now all we need is some friends to eat it. <laughs> The recipe says when it is served, the top of the meringue should be taken off and broken and a piece of it handed around with a spoonful of the cream. Everyone's favourites were the custard filled cakes a la duchesse, the almond wafers and the meringue with the cream and strawberries. And as I suspected, the confectioner's paste was just too solid to eat. It just couldn't bite into it. So it's basically there just for the structure of the piece. Click here to see more 200 year old dessert recipes, here for my latest video and here to subscribe to How To Cook That. There's a link below to the How To Cook That merch. We have some specials on this week, so make sure you go and check that out. Make it a great week and I'll see you on Friday.